Good evening and welcome to tonight's event. I'm absolutely thrilled to see so many of you in spite of the not so pleasant weather today. My name is Eva Paus. I'm a professor of economics and the Carol Hoffman Collins director of the McCulloch Center for Global Initiatives here at the college, one of the sponsors of tonight's events. The other sponsors are the departments of politics and international relations, the Center for the Weizmann Center for Leadership, and of course, the Odyssey Bookshop. There are <laughs> there are two people here without whom tonight's event would not happen. In addition to the two people on stage, <laughs> and they are. Joan Grenier, the owner of the Odyssey Bookshop. <laughs> and Linda Chesky Fernandez, the, uh, the soul of the International Relations and Politics Department. <laughs> after, the, after the conversation tonight, uh, there will be mics in the aisle, so we have opportunities for, you will have opportunity to ask questions. And after the Q&A, Secretary Kerry will sign books over here on the right, and this may be a good moment to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. It is my great privilege and honor to introduce tonight's event. The speakers really need no introduction. John Kerry's autobiography is the subject matter of tonight's conversation, so it would be foolish for me to provide a synopsis of the major achievements of our longtime Massachusetts Senator and then Secretary of State in the Obama administration. And you all know John Weston, our Dean of the Faculty, and the Carol Hoffman Collins Professor of International Relations with a long time teaching and research interest in human rights, post-conflict society, and international security. So instead, I want to take a moment to highlight an important characteristic, a character trait that the two Johns share, and that is so desperately needed in today's challenging times, moral courage or as we say in German, civil courage. Moral courage is the courage to speak out and to act for moral reasons, not well knowing the risk of adverse consequences. In the early 1990s, John Weston worked as the Balkans analyst in the Bureau of Intelligence and Research at the State Department. He became increasingly critical of U.S. policy in the area. And on August 6, 1993, he resigned very publicly from the State Department over the U.S. government's policy towards Bosnia and its implicit tolerance of war crimes. 25 years earlier, when serving in Vietnam, John Kerry came to experience firsthand the insanity of U.S. policy there. Upon returning to the U.S., he became an outspoken critic of the war and a very public spokesperson for VEAW, Vietnam Veterans Against the War. In his now famous testimony before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee on April 23, 1971, Kerry said, and I quote, we could be quiet we could hold our silence. We could not tell what went on in Vietnam. But we feel because of what threatens this country, not the Reds, but the crimes that we are committing that threaten it, that we have to speak out." End quote. We're very fortunate that John Kerry has continued to speak out. And his autobiography offers, offers vivid testimony to that effect. We are very fortunate to have him here tonight, and please join me in welcoming Dean Weston and Secretary Kerry.
thank you, Professor Powles, for that very generous introduction. And uh, thank you, Secretary Kerry, for uh, spending some time with us this evening. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on this rainy day, rainy evening. Um, and uh, we really appreciate uh, your attendance here this evening. Um, I'd like to, um, to start uh, this evening um, with uh, um, uh, a description of Mount Holyoke College. Mount Holyoke is the oldest continuing women's college in the country. It was founded in 1837 by Mary Lyon. <laughs> Members of our community are very passionate. Um, we have a 180 year history of educating and empowering women and girls in the community around us uh, and fighting against all forms of of stereotyping, gender stereotyping. You've been in the news recently uh, with, in an exchange with President Trump and Secretary Pompeo on Iran, and we'll get to the discussion about Iran and foreign policy in a few minutes, but I want to begin briefly just with a comment that was made recently in a Bill Maher interview uh, in which you described President Trump as insecure as a teenager, and I believe that you share our concerns in, about gender stereotyping and then Wondering if you'd comment a little bit. Well, about well, that. you should. Look, I understand. I, I'm. Uh, <laughs> first of all, let me just say thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm very privileged and honored to be here at Mount Holyoke. I've admired for years uh, this college's extraordinary uh, education base and participation in the community. Uh, and I might add, in a number of my elections. So thank you very much. <laughs> Um, and uh, none of you look 180 years old, so I want you to know you're, you're doing okay. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I was pretty shocked that day, actually, when, when President Trump saw fit to tweet and Twitter about me. Um, and I, I responded uh, pretty directly, but, you know, it seemed to me... First of all, I was an immature eight-year-old boy, so I thought I had a right to say something about myself in that context. And I raised two extraordinary uh, daughters, uh, both of whom obviously were teenagers for a period of time, and they're now the most strong, remarkable, incredible citizens and young women, and I'm so proud of them. So I thought I was sort of touching on uh, uh, permissible territory as an experienced father. But that said, um, the point I was really trying to make is no president, no 72-year-old president of the United States should behave like a child. That was the point I was really trying to make. And, um, and, and let's face it, we all know um, young folks have a hard role period, without any gender attachments to it. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, the best thing one can do is probably not compare them at all to Donald Trump. That's an injustice, uh, given that life is hard enough without that. So I've retired the comparison, um, and, and you won't hear it again. That said, at least with a gender attachment, um, that said, I want you to know I'm, I'm uh, as that proud father of two young daughters, one of whom is a critical care physician at, at Mass General Hospital and has started a global health program called Seed Global Health. And she's out in the world with, in five African countries now building health care capacity for those countries, not just treating people, but making sure that after a year of doctors from America coming over to teach them they're building the capacity for themselves, which is leaving something lasting, and I'm very proud of her. She's in New York this week at the UN General Assembly. My other daughter is in the creative world. Uh, she's been a filmmaker and uh, is currently working on content in this new world of so many different platforms. So they're fabulous, and um, you know they let me off the hook a few times. Uh, let me just say also, but I'm proud of this. I want to tell you, I'll uh, share with you, um, because I've been a powerful advocate for 
breaking the ceilings and, and dealing with what we need to do in this country, it is still incomprehensible to me that women are underpaid compared to men. It is incomprehensible to me that we have only 25 CEOs of 500 different Fortune 500 companies. Uh, it's wrong that we still have, when I came to the Senate, there were as many female United States senators as I had daughters. And one of them lost the race the next time out, so we had one. Now that's changed, 20 something, I forget the number, but still not enough. When I was Secretary of State, I was determined to change that. And so I appointed the first ever Deputy Secretary of State as a woman, and five of my six Assistant Secretaries of State were women, and four of my six Under Secretaries of State were women. That's unprecedented. And um, we broke the ceiling. So I'm very sensitive to, to the stereotypes and the caricatures, and obviously uh, we need to, to end them. I hope and pray that in this midterm election, I have high expectations that there will be a wave of women candidates elected across the country who will go down and make sure that we do the things that the men in Washington in the House and Senate are not getting done. And I hope that'll happen. And looking out in the audience, I see a lot of future senators, House members, presidents of this country and many others. So um, uh, I'd like to start a discussion about your book uh, with a quote from the, a a the afterword in the book. Um, you, you write, and I'm quoting here, all of the recounting and retelling also reminded me that the world has always been complicated, truly complicated, that the fight at home has always been a struggle. And from that you conclude, that is what makes me all the more optimistic about today. Because I've seen with my own eyes that the institutions the founders created to hold America together have worked best when America needed them most. So um, my question is, why are you so confident that American institutions will prevail? And is democracy self-executing? No, democracy is clearly, absolutely not self-executing, and we cannot, any of us, believe that this great nation of ours and its democracy are an automatic pilot. We are not. Democracy anywhere and everywhere requires huge participation. Uh, and I will get to the why I am optimistic, but I want to say a word about this because it's really at the, at the center of what motivated me to write the book and motivates me to be here tonight and to not retire and to be engaged in public life because nobody can retire right now. We have to save our country. Uh, and, and I mean that quite literally. <laughs> when I look at climate change, when I look at extremism, I look at the transition taking place in so many different respects in life. Uh, we have a lot of fighting to do, but folks, let me just say to everybody here, we have tried, for you students of history particularly, and political science, every form of government that I think can be tried. Go back to ancient times. I mean, go back to the Roman Empire. Go back to the Greeks, to the beginning of democracy. Go back to the various empires that controlled life for so much. Go back to the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, and so forth. The Renaissance, the, 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 you know, the Reformation. The, you can go through it all. The Age of Reason. All of it has been the development of humankind's capacity to think and to adopt a set of values by which we live. And we in America are one of the latest experiments when you think about it. Uh, and it came out of uh, the debates in France, Rousseau, Voltaire, the rights of man, Thomas Paine, blah, blah, blah. You know the sort of routine. But it's not to be, it's not to be trifled with. It's not to be just sort of not casually put aside. Human beings have always been on this search for meaning uh, in life, and, and what is the virtuous life? What is the way in which we should conduct ourselves? And I think we Americans have landed on something pretty special. I really believe that. Despite the fact that we still have too much racism and too much resistance to women and, and, and 
uh, you know, discrimination and all the other components of our society. Uh, but we've tried them, folks. We've had despots, we've had dictators of the worst order, we've had benevolent dictatorships, we've had despotic, uh, malevolent dis dictatorships, we've had uh, monarchies of all form and shape, we've had constitutional monarchy, parliamentary monarchy, we've had constitutional presidency, presidential government, non-presidential government, parliamentary government, communism, socialism, and far-right fascist dictatorships. We've done it all. And as Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government in the world, except for everything else. <laughs> that's where we are. I'm telling you, that's where we are. Now, why am I optimistic? I'll tell you why I'm optimistic. Because we've been there. I was there. Many of you, I'm looking around. I see a few gray hairs here. You guys were part of this. Back in 1968, when I came back from Vietnam, in fact, before 68, my freshman year at college, we almost had a war with the Soviet Union over Cuba. My sophomore year, I was sitting on a bench in the Harvard-Yale game, and, 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 and uh, uh, you know, we started to hear a ripple in the audience, which I write about, that President Kennedy had been shot. And that turned into a day and weekend and months of mourning because he was dead. That's what I learned uh, in the middle of that game. I couldn't even remember who won the game. I had to look it up, go back to the Yale Daily News when I wrote this book. And the next year, we had the Civil Rights Movement with dogs chewing at people, the Edmund Bettis Bridge and, and, and Bull Connor and, the, you know, and, and people couldn't vote in America and they were still being lynched in trees in the South. And I remember getting in a car with my friend and driving down the South in the spring vacation and seeing my first ever whites only sign, no colored, uh, and so forth. And one year later, we were all confronted with Vietnam. Life was gonna change. Some people went to Canada, some people went to jail. Uh, people made different choices. When I signed up, it was 1965. Tonkin Gulf had just happened. Uh, and I was the son of a World War II parents, which I describe in the book. So I had a sense of service, a sense of duty and responsibility about it. But those were four years of education, which then translated into 1968 when Medgar Evers was assassinated and Martin Luther King was assassinated and then Robert Kennedy was assassinated. And then we had pipe bombs going off in various communities of America. We had people with machine guns and people being kidnapped and people uh, in, in Detroit, the, the community burning. You remember all those of you who were there? That's, that's the memory. We had a president of the United States who was attacking the Justice Department, had an enemies list, and was ultimately proved to be a crook and violated every notion of decency. So what did we do? We didn't crawl up under a rock. We didn't go home and say we can't do anything. Granted, we didn't have to contend with platforms of communication that have so altered the flow of facts, and that's something else we have to get to. But we confronted this. And I remember the first thing I did when I came back from Vietnam, John, was not, was not demonstrate against the war, because I was trying to figure out, you know, how do you do, what do you do? Uh, there were uncertainties, until as I write in my book, I got a letter about my, one of my best friends in Vietnam being killed, about three weeks after I got back. And I write about that, and I quote a lot from the letter. By the way, this book is not a, a Secretary of State policy tome. This book is a journey. It's an American journey. And I'm very proud to tell you that last, last night I was in New York, spoke at a big dinner there in, in conjunction with the UN stuff, and Tina Brown, maybe you may know of and remember from her leadership of many major magazines in America, including uh, uh, The New Yorker, which she most recently edited, and she, she said publicly at the thing, she said, you know, I thought this book was going to be a, a, a skim. And I dug into it, and I've read every word of it. I couldn't put it down. Because it, she said it was so vivid, it was so clear. She actually called it brilliant. Now, I'm not going to assert that. But, <laughs> but I let you be your own judge. I think this book is worth the read. Uh, and I think people are finding that as they go along. And the reason I say that is, I lay it all out there, folks. Uh, you know, I talk about the, the early years, uh, 
failures. I talk about a failed marriage. I talk about what it was like to lose an election, coming back from the war, how you pick yourself up after losing the presidency by one state. Uh, and I think there's some grist in there. I got a letter today from a guy in Rhode Island. I know I'm diverting. But I just, you know, he told me he'd lost an election. He didn't know what to do. He was reading my book, and he felt better about life as a result, which is a great, if that alone comes to you, that's pretty good. I want to come back to what I'm saying, optimism. What I did when I came back was uh, get involved in Earth Day, 1970. We brought 20 million Americans out of their homes because they didn't want to live next to a toxic waste site. They didn't want to drink water that made them sick. They didn't want to see the Cuyahoga River in Ohio lighting on fire spontaneously, as it did. And so we didn't stop with the day we brought them out. We politicized it. We made it into a quest to make the environment a voting issue. And we succeeded beyond our dreams. We targeted the 12 worst votes in the United States Congress on the environment. We labeled them the dirty dozen. In the next election, 1972, seven of the 12 lost their seats. And I'm telling you, as a 28-year veteran of the Senate, thanks to all of you or many of you, there is nothing that stiffens the spine of the survivors more than the loss of some of their colleagues. It works. And that's what happened. We passed the Clean Air Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Coastal Zone Management Act. We actually got Richard Nixon to sign the EPA into a law. America didn't have an Environmental Protection Agency till then. So we made things happen. And, and my message to you tonight is this. Our system is broken, badly broken. But it's not broken because the institutions themselves won't let us do things. It's not broken because the rules are stacked against us, though there are things stacked against us because of laws that have been passed. It is broken because there's too much money in American politics stealing the agenda from average people and because of, of, and because of gerrymandering, which denies us a legitimate election in November. So we don't have a democracy. Now, how do you get that back? I'll tell you how you get it back. You make, you politicize, you have to make these things voting issues. And here's the most telling thing of all. I want you to remember the magic number, 54.2. That's the percentage of our fellow Americans who are eligible to vote who saw fit to go out and vote. Can you imagine that? When I ran and lost in 2004, we had 60.3% turnout. When Barack Obama won in 2008, we had 62.3%. Still not enough. But you see the difference. The story of what we have going on in America today is not the story of those people who elected this president. It is the story of the people who did not come out and vote. That's the story. And so, why am I optimistic? I'm optimistic because we're doing things on this planet we never dreamed we'd do. We're curing diseases we never thought we'd cure. Smallpox, polio, TB. We're, we're now doing highly specialized, individualized cancer treatments for people because of the genome. We're on the brink of having the first generation of children born AIDS-free in Africa because of what America has done with respect to antiretroviral drugs and PEPFAR. That's what comes. We stopped Ebola in its tracks. When we were told in the Situation Room of the White House, a million people are going to die in the next four months, we said no. We sent 4,000 American troops over to West Africa. We worked with the British and the French. Each took a country, and a tiny fraction of that million actually died, and we stopped Ebola where we wanted to stop it. We can do things. I would, I would say to you, I mean, if you're a woman in the world today, yes, we have about 300,000 women a year who die in childbirth. That's 300,000 too many. But guess what? We are 50% more likely that a woman will not die in childbirth than they were 10 years ago. We're 50% more likely that a child is going to live and go to school and be fed. We have 450 million Chinese who have come out of poverty and are now in the middle class. 400 million Indians run around to countries. South Korea. South Korea 15 years ago was receiving aid from us and other developed countries. Today, South Korea is giving aid to other countries. 
So I, I am an optimist because we've been through this before in our own country. We went through terrible times with the Red Scare and the Depression in the 1920s and 30s. We went through Vietnam and the terrible period of the 60s I just described. And I am convinced if people will go vote and we restore facts, not alternative facts, but facts to the political dialogue of our country, we will regain our country and our future. And we need to do it. So we're on a college campus, um, and I want to turn a little bit back to, to, the, to your campus life. Um, you went to Yale, which I hear is a good school. Um, um, but the Vietnam War, as you spoke about, happened while you were, you were a student. And the bookend of your, um, the bookends of your, of your, your college career were, were pretty profound in terms of American history, as you've just described. Um, and you had, uh, you joined the service um, and you fought in Vietnam. And you speak of that in your book as, um, uh, in, in, in quite profound language. And, and I, I would echo Secretary Kerry's comments that this is a deep read um, and it is, it is definitely well uh, worth, worth your time to, 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 to um, pick it up and read it. Um, it's kind of embarrassing when the moderator has to echo the author who has talked about his own book. I'm sorry about it. But I want to I wanna talk about a passage that you wrote about your friend Dick Pershing, who was killed in Vietnam. And you were deploying to Vietnam at the time you received it, the, the telegraph, uh, or the telegram. Um, and you said, you write that you were desperately sad. Um, and then you wrote that Persia's, Persia's death increased your skepticism about the war. Right or wrong, it made more immediate and sensitive the growing doubts about the truth of what we were being told. It was a blow to whatever idealism about the war, war remained in me. Suddenly there was a personal cost. None of us in our little world had paid, for, had paid thus far. And I guess that's a question about participation in the political system and the question of opposition and dissent. Did it take a personal cost to you to really challenge your, your, your convictions and your idealism? And does it take that for Americans to, to really get mobilized and motivated, whether it's against war or against any political injustice? Does it take a personal cost? Would we have fewer wars if the costs were more evenly distributed? Would we have um, more activism if the, the, the distribution of, of inequity and injustice were more, more um, distributed across American society than in just uh, certain areas? Well, the last two parts of the question are very, very key. And they have, there's a different answer to, to those two questions than to the first question about does it take that personal cost to do it. No, I mean, no, it doesn't take the personal cost. And as I write, the personal cost raised questions. It, it, it jolted me. But it wasn't the reason for me making the decisions that I made. When I got to Vietnam, within hours, I began to have input that just reeked of, of our lack of capacity to make this work. I mean, when I get into my uh, base, the base camp for the, the swift boats where we were, um, and, and I see Vietnamese being trucked in, and, and, and I write about it, you know, sort of staring out of this slatted rear of a truck and, and coming in to do all the work, all the menial work, uh, and, and kind of being bossed around, and I thought somewhat exploited, if not abused. Um, I just you know, from a human point of view, I said, this, this is not great. This is not going to work. When I began to see the definitions of free fire zones, which included women and children and people who obviously weren't enemy, um, at least not in any potency or, you know, any way that threatened us, um, and so forth. And I describe it all. I mean, there were just so many things in the ad in the edition. But um, so... Those were the things that really galvanized me more. It was the policy. It was the lack of leadership, the lack of a strategy, the absurdity of these 50-foot aluminum boats driving up a river that was sometimes 
only just wide enough for the boat to be able to turn in. I mean, literally, with its nose muzzled in the mud or the mangrove, and we'd spin around and get out. Um, almost always ambushed, rarely shot first. Um, you know, you, you sort of say, what are we doing? What is it? Who was thinking about this? And I remember going back. I went back as secretary. I write about it. I went back, and I met a guy, uh, 72 years old, who tried to kill me. He was part of the team that was there to kill the swift boats. And he described it. He said, you know, we could hear you guys coming from three miles away. That's what we would say to our commanders. Guys, we got twin diesel engines, 1,000 horsepower. You can hear it forever. And we, you, know, you know they dig in the holes, they fire at us, they get down, and we fire away, and we're not firing at anything. I mean, you don't want to get me started tonight. <laughs> I, I'm just telling you folks that I came away with a sense of, um, you know, I very much like <laughs> Yossarian in Catch-22. I mean, you kind of feel you're locked in that Catch-22. Um, it wasn't until years later, by the way, that I really learned how early the lying began. I didn't know it um, until I read Neil Sheehan's Bright Shining Lie, which I think is the best book written on, on sort of the course of, of the war. Um, there are other great books in the war. The things they carry with them, Tim O'Brien, other people's thing, books are really wonderful. But that's what crystallized it. Now, coming back to your question of, of, of of loss and, and the, you know, I think that um, uh, it, it, it galvanized. It wasn't the, re the rationale. It was, and, and in the case of Dick, uh, who was an extraordinary athlete and one of those guys who just sort of cruised through college, um, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, it was particularly harsh on all of us who were his closest, who were among his closest friends. Um, I think, though, it would, it would have been an error and in, inappropriate to just personalize it that way and therefore turn against it. There had to be larger reasons for dealing with the question of, of, of a war that your nation was in where your leaders are telling you this is critical in terms of our battle against communism and we have to fight, you know, it's the domino theory, we can't allow successive loss of these countries and somehow people sort of swallowed all of that. Um, you know, I think um, it, it raised, it, it, it indelibly imprinted in me something that I also write about later in the book because as a senator, uh, it kept me going after the Reagan administration on the Contras. I mean, I'm the guy who blew the whistle on the Contra problem and Oliver North and what he was doing. And I went after Noriega and the drugs that we were discovering. The, the money that we found in the bank called BCCI, which we then got shut down. Ironically, my five-year classmate from school, at high school, uh, Bob Muller, was the head of the, was the, head of the uh, criminal division of the Justice Department, and I turned over to him the materials after having had no success getting other people to do it, and Bob Mueller appointed 37 different prosecutors, and they went out and got the job done and shut the bank down. So, you know, that, uh, that I think, is, you know, we need, we need, it's what I was saying earlier, folks. The rules haven't changed. The institution hasn't per se changed. It's the people who have changed. And so we have to change the people. I mean, we have to have people in there who will persist and, and put, I mean, what makes me angrier than anything else right now in terms of what is going on, and there's a lot to be upset about in our country right now. I mean, you know, there, but there isn't any problem we face today that we can't solve if we want to, if we put our minds to it and find that ingredient that John McCain and I found, a whole chapter of John McCain and my journey to try to resolve the problem of Vietnam. And, and that's a whole different story. I won't go off on it yet, but I'd just say to you that we work bipartisanly. We came from different places. John was a prisoner for five and a half years. I was first a combatant in the South, a very different war from his, and then I was a protester. But John McCain and I wound up together standing in his cell in Hanoi where we found the common ground of not only making peace with Vietnam, 
but we found the common ground of trying to make peace here at home with ourselves, because we were still at war with each other over Vietnam in 1990. So we did that. And it's one of the things I'm proudest of in terms of my time in the Senate. But that's what we have to restore today. We have to get back to this feeling that, you know, we have to get, I mean, the people like the Ted Cruz's who think it's my way or the Hawaii highway, uh, boy, I hope uh, Beto O'Rourke can put him on the highway. Um, you know, because that's no way, that is not what our forefathers and, and the founding fathers foresaw. Uh, and, and any of you have seen the, you know, marvelous uh, Hamilton, you know, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about, folks. You get in the room where it happens and you have a compromise. And the compromise can wind up deciding where the nation's capital is and deciding what your federal uh, monetary system is. It, it, it's the nature of compromise, of making a deal. But we don't have people who want to do that right now. They want to just stop everything. They want to break it apart. They're there to throw bombs. And uh, that's not how democracy can survive. So I feel very strongly about this. And, and it burns me up that some of my former colleagues, who I thought better of, frankly, regarding this, but they are now all knowledgeable. There is no secret in Washington that people didn't know that hasn't appeared in the Woodward book or in the Wolf book. Everybody knows what's going on. Everybody knows how ill-equipped this administration is. Everybody knows what a desperate day every day is where you never know where it's going or where it's going to come back to. That is no way to run the presidency of the United States. There's no way to be the leader of the free world. And the fact is that, sadly, members of the United States Senate have proven that they care more about power, about party, and president than they care about that oath they took to uphold the Constitution of the United States and our institutions, <laughs> period. So this gets to a, a question about Russia um, and Russian interference. That gets to a question about Russia, I gotta figure. <laughs> so, you know, I, I served in the State Department at the end of the Cold War in the Office of Soviet and East European Analysis. And one of the things that struck me was how profound the collapse of the Soviet Union was. And not just the empire, but just the state itself collapsed. And I think back about all of the, you know, all of the, the kind of experts in, in the Soviet Union, all of the, you know, the, the folks working on it from the American side, but also thinking about it from the Soviet perspective. And, and Vladimir Putin was a, a, a relatively senior um, KGB official at the time. He saw a state collapse. Uh, there's a profound component to that. The largest, kind of the, one of the strongest military states in the history of the world just ended. And it ended because of a fundamental crisis of legitimacy, the fact that the state itself couldn't adjudicate basic, uh, kind of uh, 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 respond to and adjudicate basic um, contestation. And so as I think about the Russian influence in, in the elections, I wonder if Putin isn't kind of taking a, a lesson from his own experiences in understanding the collapse of the Soviet state and trying to uh, create a, uh, a moment in which the United States is simply unable to, to talk to one another, folks in the United States. And whether or not that's um, part of his playbook, but also is this a moment in which the, the, the democratic institutions of the country are at risk? And can the state collapse? Well, okay, let me try to dissect that question if I can, uh, John, because I don't accept the premise that Putin uh, can individually, you know, bring our nation down in terms of his interventions. His interventions are, are insidious. They have some impact. They're wrong. Uh, and, and we have to push back and fight back against it very forcefully. But far more serious in terms of the diminution of America's democracy right now and the problem we have is the attitude 
of the people who have come to Congress. And I saw this begin, folks, in 1994 uh, with the Gingrich Revolution. That's really when it began. Actually, it began before that. It began with a Southern strategy, with Richard Nixon to some degree, and it began with the exploitation by a guy named Dick Vigory of direct mail, which was extremely negative back in the, that period of time. And that was the first wave of kind of under the radar screen attacks. Now they're obviously overt and, and out, in, out in, the, in public. And I was the first, uh, my year was the first uh, example of really fake news attack on a major public stage where they Trump, you know, the, Trump, that's the wrong phrase. They, they put together the, um, you know, swift boat attacks and totally distorted my record and just lied and lied and lied again. And I write in the book, I lay out very clearly each lie, but despite our, our, our demasking the lie and showing them on the front pages of the Washington Post, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Boston Globe, Chicago Tribune, Miami Herald, uh, you know, Los Angeles Times, every newspaper in America covered the facts. But they continued to just advertise and put it out on TV. And if you don't answer it, for whatever the group is that happens to see that, it's meaningful. That's where alternative facts come in. What the, what's happened in America is we've got this self-selective process now by which people go to news they trust. They go to news where they want to hear it. So you go to MSNBC, you go to NBC, you go wherever you go, or you go to Fox, or you go to Breibart, whatever it is, and you get the news that reinforces your position. You don't necessarily get facts. And you don't have a breadth that a democracy requires to begin to be able to make the kinds of decisions necessary to build consensus around issues. Democracy requires the building of consensus. But if you're constantly dividing people and preventing them from knowing what the baseline of facts are, that's how you put the democracy at risk. So I see far more risk to our democracy coming from ourselves, coming from the indifference, coming from the unwillingness of major platforms to get together to decide how they're going to actually prove what the facts are and, and get people to make decisions on those facts. And, and um, that's a bigger challenge right now because if you can't build consensus, how do you make a decision? How do you decide to do the things you need to do? And we're not doing them today in America, my friends. That's what motivates me. That's what bothers me so much. I mean, I, I could give you graphic examples. China is spending a trillion dollars a year to have a one belt, one road initiative that reaches out to about 70 countries, building a new Silk Road from China all the way to the Atlantic, to the east. And, and they're spending $500 billion on new technology labs and research labs for each of the countries touched on by the One Belt, One Road. They've built 49 different railroad routes from China to Europe. You can now send cargo on a railroad from China to Finland, and it's cheaper than going by air or by sea. We're not doing anything. We're, we're, I, I'm sorry to tell you, the last infrastructure project that you could identify in America that was a national project was the Big Dig. I, and, and, you know, it's really sad. I rode on a train in, in Beijing that goes 300 miles an hour, and I'm holding this glass. At 300 miles an hour, that's about what the glass water looked like going to Tianjin. 300 miles an hour. Now, we have the regional Amtrak. <laughs> we got the Acela. The Acela can go 155 miles an hour. Uh, from Washington to New York, you know how much, how many miles it goes? 150, more than 150? 18 miles. It can't go fast under the Baltimore Tunnel because the vibrations might cave the tunnel in. It can't go fast over those little rickety bridges of the Chesapeake because it'll wind up in the Chesapeake. <laughs> I have to tell you, I, I get, we, look at our cities, mired in traffic jams. You can't move anywhere anymore, anywhere in America frankly, in parts of the world. But they're building mass transit. We're not. We need to get serious about re 
building America. That's how you make America strong. And by the way, you know, I, 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 it's not just a question of making America great again. I think America is a great country. I think we've always been a great country. I think you need to make America fair again and sensible again and invest in the future for next generations. We're not doing it on energy. You, you've got, we don't even have a national grid in America. Do you know that? We don't have a grid. We have an East Coast grid, you get your energy. We have a West Coast grid. We have a little line that goes across from Chicago to the Dakotas. You have a you know, line there. Then you have a big hole in the middle of the country. You can't send renewable portfolio energy from Iowa or Minnesota or somewhere to another part of the country. And of course, Texas has its own grid. Right, go figure. <laughs> so that's how it works. And, and the sad thing is, the solution to climate change is energy policy. It's staring us in the face. We don't have to wait 10 years, five years to solve climate change. We just have to make the decision to get people off of coal, to move people away from fossil fuels, and to start doing the things necessary to get the private sector to be willing to put more money into the R&D that's going to give us the battery storage, that's going to give us the gigawatts we need to be able to produce electricity for this country. And we can do it today. We already can do it. Um, last year, now, I negotiated the Paris Agreements, and I'm particularly versed in this after 30 plus years of working on it. When I was Lieutenant Governor here in this state, Mike Dukakis let me be a chair of a National Governors Conference, of, of, a, of a committee. So I worked with John Sununu in New Hampshire and Dick Celeste in Ohio, and we took an idea from the American Enterprise Institute, which was a market-based idea to try to deal with uh, acid rain. And guess what? We adopted it. And it became the Clean Air Act amendment on acid rain, and we don't hear about acid rain anymore in the information, because we did it. We could do the same thing for climate change because it's the largest market the world has ever seen. It's a four to five billion user market today. It's gonna to go up to nine billion users in the next 30 years. There are already multi-trillions of dollars of value in that market, and we have the technologies to be able to do what we need to do. It's people who aren't making the choice. So I keep coming back. How are you gonna get there? How do you get to making the choice? Only one way, activism. People have to be active in our democracy and make sure we are electing people who will get the job done. And what's happened in the last year is the reason people are so angry, everybody's angry, right, center, left, liberal, conservative, and I understand the anger, I'm angry, I share it, because it's not working. There's nothing happening in the United States Senate today, I hate to say that after 28 years, not happening. All gamesmanship on a daily basis, Kavanaugh, whatever the hell it is, they're not getting the job done for people because they can't. And what you had was the Gingrich Revolution, then the Gingrich Revolution didn't make it. What'd they promise? Gonna get rid of Roe v. Wade, gonna have no regulations, we're gonna have lesser regulations, smaller government, lower your taxes, you know all the promises. None of them were delivered. So people got angry. You had the Tea Party. Tea Party made the same promises. Nothing happened. You had the Freedom Caucus. Freedom Caucus made the same promises. Gridlock in Washington. Swamp. Nothing happens. So Donald Trump comes along and you have a hostile takeover of the Republican Party. That's what happened. And now he's working overtime trying to appeal to his base. Always to, even his speech at the UN today, appeal to his base. The problem is you can't solve Americans' problems just dealing with your base. You've got to unite the country. You gotta pull people together around real choices that make a difference that will raise the quality of life, raise people's salaries, make it possible for people not to work two or three jobs to make ends meet, make education affordable, have health care that can't be taken away. These are things that have to happen, and they can happen. But I don't see any, I mean, I don't see a major debate in Washington on this stuff. That's why I, I personally believe, you ask me why I'm optimistic, because I believe people are energized. And I believe that there is the possibility of a major course correction in 40 whatever days when we have the midterm elections. And if we do the right thing, we will have the ability to set this country back on course, starting with that, 
ending in 2020. And by the way, you don't pull out of Paris. You can pull out of Paris, but you're not formally out of Paris till one day after the next election. That's motivation, folks. So, I think we have some time for some questions and answers. So, um, I don't know if I see Mike set up, though. Um, uh, let me figure out, do you have, you have the mics? The mics are coming out. So while we're waiting for that, I do have one question, uh, one final question, which is um, probably a short one. But who do you see emerging in the Democratic Party in 2020 uh, as the, um, as the I've, likely I've, next president? I have been crystal clear on this, and I'm not faking it. I'm not, it's not a ploy. I don't want to talk, I don't, anybody should be talking about 2020. I've said it again and again. All the focus of energy needs to be on electing a House and Senate that will change the direction. We have the greatest course that's available to us. Let's go do it. You know. um. So if you have questions, you can line up here, um, and we'll take a few. Maybe we can take, I'm sorry? Oh, and there's another one that's coming. Uh, so maybe we'll take three questions to start, and um, uh, so why don't you say your name and uh, uh, speak directly into the mic, please, so everybody can hear you. Okay, let's roll, because I want to try and answer as many as I can. Hi, so. my name is Molly Kleinman. I'm a sophomore here at Mount Holyoke. I know you spoke a lot about why you're optimistic, but as someone who's 19, as someone who's never really lived through periods in the U.S. of this much chaos, I find it really hard to stay motivated. What encourages you to stay motivated through all of that? Well, I, I hope that I spoke to that earlier, but I want to say to you, look, every movement in this nation that has made a difference in my lifetime, and, that, and there have been a, quite a few, the peace movement, the environment movement, the women's movement, I mean, those are just stars. You can, you know, the, the civil rights movement. I mean, and I was able to take part in, in, in pieces of each of that. You know who made it work? The people who really did the work and the people who inspired there were a few leaders around, Allard Lowenstein and Bobby Kennedy and President, but it was young people. We used to call them the peanut butter and jelly brigade, and they went up to New Hampshire, and it was those young people knocking on doors and who were part of campaigns who allowed Gene McCarthy to send a message to Lyndon Johnson, you can't run for president. That's what happened. It, it, it's hard work, guys. Uh, maybe, maybe, I don't know, I, I just keep, talking with a lot of uh, folks to try to figure out if there's a different way of looking at these things. But as I said earlier, there are not a lot of alternatives. If you want the world to be the world you want it to be, there's nothing better than deciding to go out and make it that. And that's how it works. You really can make a difference. And, and I've seen Lech Walesa jumped over a fence. He was a union guy. There was a strike. He jumped over the fence and joined the strike, and he became the president of his country. Vaclav Havel was a poet. He was in jail for years. He came out because of what he believed. I mean, you think you want to be depressed and have a feeling there's no future? Be in jail alone for a long period of time. But he came out and ready to go back and fight. So I urge you, think about Gandhi. Think about people who have put their lives on the line to make a difference. One of the things that struck me as Secretary of State and as a Senator, as Chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, I marvel at the courage of people who are in prison because of the things they believe in a country where you don't even know they're there. None of us in this room know their names. None of us in this room know what they're going through today or tomorrow, what happened to them, but they're going through hell right now because they believe in the kind of opportunity that we have in the United States of America. And that's where America is at its best, inspiring people to do that. And you as a young person, boy, you're our future. You gotta believe in the possibility of that change. I mean, go back to the beginning of our country. Those, those, those soldiers down at Valley Forge, when it looked bleak as hell. And, and you know, Payne wrote about summertime soldiers and sunshine patriots. And what we wound up with was winter soldiers. People who hung in in the winter of Valley Forge and, you know, we almost lost, guys. 
George Washington was in a you know, frenzy. We were losing. People were deserting. We're, we're here because a bunch of folks were willing to hang at the end of a British rope and thought they might, but they hung in there. And I leave you with just one message. Go back. I urge you to read the history of the so the evolution of the Constitution in 1779, when Dr. Benjamin Franklin, after months of work in the Philadelphia Constitution Hall, came out of the hall, he was walking down the stairs late at night when they'd finished their work, and a woman shouted at him and said, tell us, Dr. Franklin, what do we have, a monarchy or a republic? And he looked at her and he said, a republic, if you can keep it. That's our mission today. And frankly, it's your mission. You got to do that. So if you don't, if, if that four minute soliloquy didn't persuade you, <laughs> then I invite you to read my book. <laughs> because it's filled with examples of how you can make that kind of a difference. And it talks about that period. Uh, of darkness in the late 1960s and how we got out of it. So we have quite a few people standing in line. So I wonder if we can take three or four questions simultaneously, if we can keep them very brief. We'll take the questions and Secretary Kerry will answer them uh, after. Let's do four here and then four on this side. Oh my God. Do you have that piece of paper I can just okay. jot? I hope not. Rock and roll. Speed I round. I might have. Oh, I did. That's good. Okay. Hi, I'm Amelia Malpass, and I was wondering if you could tell your favorite anecdote from working with President Obama. Favorite anecdote working with President Obama. All right. Hi, I'm Casey Repke. I'm a sophomore here, and I know that you had mentioned that activism is the most important thing that we can do to get involved in politics but there are a lot of different ways to be an activist, like protesting and social media and voting. And I was wondering what you think the most effective mode of activism is. Hi, I'm Ariane. Thank you so much for coming, to, for coming out to see us today. I was wondering, when there are strategic priorities in countries with hostile or authoritarian leaders, such as North Korea or Iran, how do you determine whether it's appropriate to pursue negotiations, even if it means making compromises that may strengthen their leadership or undermine our own interests? <laughs> How do you determine if it's appropriate to negotiate, even if it means making a compromise that may either strengthen their leadership or undermine our own interests? Speed round. This is a question about politics and the environment and limits on on growth. I mean, you're clearly familiar uh, with Earth's limited capacity, and it's fairly self-evident that it can't support the exponential growth of anything material. Uh, and basically, the idea of the end of growth at peak energy um, can be a useful lens to look at much of current uh, chaos, if you will. So the question is, well, it's very hard for any politician to gain support uh, if they truthfully say the future can't be materially wealthier than the past. But how do we deal with the reality of the, sort of the, the needed and the, and the imposed limitations of growth? All right, that's four good questions. He's writing another book. <laughs> Anecdote, Obama. Uh, Oval Office. He turns to me and he says, John, you've got the best hair in American politics. <laughs> <Poor story. laughs> if, you've, if you've always wondered what went on in the Oval Office, now you know. Um, it's a true story. Uh, There's no one single best kind of activism. Activism is the, the conglomeration. It's the accrued effort of many different pieces. 
You have somebody who's on the radio and they have a daily show and they're banging away on the facts. You have a documentary filmmaker who makes a great film about injustice and what's happening. You're going to affect a lot of people. You have somebody who um, is going to write the new, uh, the new uh, uh, treaties on uh, freedom or on, on active, I mean, there's just so many different ways to affect, but they all require something that tries to have an impact on people's thinking and people's choices. So you can do that in lots of ways. Now, I happen to believe there is a moment in all of our social structure, life, where people are required to give into the democratic system. That means uh, doing something that affects public choices, that affects particularly campaigns. So if you want to know the most effective thing when you're two months from an election, is to be involved in that election, folks. It's very simple. And we have this incredible opportunity to mobilize all the you know, anger you have or frustration you have or cynicism you may have, pessimism, this is the moment. And, and please heed what I said to you. Elections matter. 54.2%, 62.3%. Uh, that's, that's a lot of the difference. And, and that, I, I just can't put it more bluntly. You can choose to do all kinds of things in the intervening months and days, but there comes a time when in a democracy it comes down to casting your vote, particularly on an issue that has been made a voting issue. And I think there are just plenty of those right now. On the question of uh, how do you determine uh, in terms of negotiation with leadership, there's a, there's a distinction between obviously negotiating and engaging. Uh, I am almost universally pro-engagement and not emptily not, not for the sake of simply engaging without a roadmap and without a clear agenda of how you're going to get where you're going. I think in the case of President Trump, for instance, on, on North Korea, uh, we wanted to engage North Korea. We actually had back-channel initiatives going on several different occasions. Um, we made it very clear to Kim Jong-un we were prepared to negotiate a non-aggression treaty. We were prepared to have an understanding on mutual defense. We were prepared to provide economic assistance. We were prepared to do any number of things, but providing they were genuinely prepared to denuclearize. Now, we had a clear definition of what that meant, and it's because of the clarity of our definition and the requirements that we have some show of good faith before we met that we never had a meeting. And, and that's because they cheated in the 1990s in what was called the Framework Agreement, which Bill Clinton arrived at. And because they had cheated, we didn't have as much leeway to be able to go forward. Now, President Trump made a decision to just go have a big Singapore bash. And, uh, you know, a lot of flags, a lot of glitz, a lot of uh, question marks, but it didn't come out with a communique that meant anything. And now they're trying to do a redux. They're going to meet again because they don't have a definition of what denuclearization is. And there is no methodology for how you are going to ascertain the arsenal of North Korea. Where is the arsenal? How big is the arsenal? Where and what are they willing to do to provide access to that arsenal so we can have verification? All of which, my friends, we got with Iran. So the president who pulled out of the Iran deal, saying it's the worst deal ever, has yet to prove he can get any kind of deal with North Korea at all, which begins to move you in that direction. And, and I hope he gets it, mind you. I, I'm not wishing failure here. We all need to hope this can work. And, and we'll be, all be advantaged by it. But I don't think the methodology yet is there, and I think he has a very different sense of what denuclearization means. Uh, to him, it means the United States gets its troops out of South Korea. It means that we don't have an umbrella necessarily for Japan or for Korea. And that's going to be a very hard fought uh, challenge here. Uh, if he truly is prepared to get rid of his uh, arsenal, 
uh, then we can make some progress. So you really have to measure, to answer the last part of your question, how do you decide when to negotiate, how? You negotiate when you really believe you've got a basis for a negotiation. It took me two years as, as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee working with the Omanis and others to test the Iranians and get to a place where then I was secretary, uh, the president was comfortable in authorizing an actual negotiation because we had reason to believe they were serious and that it wasn't going to be an exploitative process and a farce. We also demanded that North Korea, uh, North Korea, that, that Iran take very specific steps at the very initiation of our effort before we agreed to do anything at all. They had to destroy their centrifuges. They had to freeze where they were. They had to get rid of their stockpile of enriched uranium. They had to stop enriching above a certain level, a level above which you simply couldn't make a bomb. So we required extraordinary things. And I will just say to all of you, I'm not going to go through all of the Iran deal, but I'll tell you bluntly. It is the single strongest, most accountable, most transparent, far-reaching nuclear agreement with any country on the planet today which gave us the ability to know exactly what Iran was doing, which is why our Defense Department wanted to keep it, our intel community, and our Energy Department, which manages nuclear weapons. All of them signed off on this agreement as being a, something we would know. We weren't vouching that Iran might not try to break out one day, but we were able to vouch that if they did, we would know it. And every military option available to us in the future was available to us then. And one of the lessons I learned in Vietnam is before you send young men and women, American young men and women, off to fight a war, you better damn well exhaust all the remedies of diplomacy in order to make it clear to the Americans what you're doing. So that's how you do it. Um, on the uh, subject of uh, environment limitations and exponential growth and, and, and uh, material replenishment, et cetera, it's a really good question. Um, and, and it's a vexing one because I talk about this a lot in various places I go, having put so much time into climate. Folks, I just want to emphasize to all of you, um, if I can take a moment on this question. It's existential. I mean, it's really existential. It bothers me so much have a president of the United States without one scientific fact, without one basis of, of backup by any peer-reviewed study or analysis whatsoever, pulls America out of something 196 nations came together to start in Paris. And, and it was a huge step to get there. I was in Copenhagen. I was in most of the conferences over 25, 30 years. I was in Rio, 1992. Uh, with Al Gore and Tim Wirth and a group of us, uh, four years after Jim Hansen at the NASA had said, climate change is happening. And George Herbert Walker Bush signed on to a voluntary structure to deal with climate. It just didn't work because it was voluntary and it wasn't urgent enough. So here we are today in 2018. We're at about 1.5 degrees centigrade of increase in the warmth of the planet. Scientists tell us that two degrees centigrade is a tipping point. But no scientist and none of us, I can't tell you where that tipping point takes us. I don't know. I just know it's a tipping point. That it, things begin to unravel. Ecosystems. An ecosystem is a system. And nobody quite knows if one piece of it starts to go into extremis what happens to the rest of it? So there is a precautionary principle of governing. It's a principle that everybody ought to adopt. We buy insurance for our home. We buy insurance for car. We buy insurance for life. We buy health insurance. We buy all these insurances. But we're not buying insurance for this planet. We're not buying insurance. And by the way, we're spending a hell of a lot of money, more money than we would be if we were buying it. Right now, last year, three storms. Irma, Harvey, and, and uh, Maria. Those three storms cost 
$265 billion. You, you paid for that. It's one third of the Defense Department budget. It's more money than we spend on the Commerce Department, the Education Department, uh, four other departments put together. We dump more water in Houston in five days than goes over Niagara Falls in a year. Irma had the first sustained 185 miles an hour wind for 24 hours ever recorded. And Maria, we know, destroyed Puerto Rico. I mean, folks, this is serious stuff. I'm not trying to scare people because, as I said, the energy choices we could make today make the difference. Now, I'm proud to tell you this. The 196 countries that went to Paris that we worked, the United States led that. I went to China and negotiated with President Xi. I got the agreement that we would work together for the first time ever. And China and the United States stood up together in Beijing, announced our reductions in emissions, and that led the rest of the world to Paris to get the job done. It really did. We changed the dynamic. But, but now we're pulling out, which takes away our leadership from the table. And the rest of the world stayed, but you know what they're, ha you know what they're doing now? Other leaders are backing off a little and saying, well, if the United States isn't going to do this, why should, well, maybe we shouldn't have to do it. And so it's undermining Paris. But here in America, governors, governors, mayors around the country in 38 states, we have renewable portfolio laws that are passed, including here. We're moving towards alternative renewable. Not fast enough, but moving. The theory of Paris was we were going to excite the energy of the private sector to do a lot of investing, and in fact, it worked. We got $358 billion going into these things. It's not happening fast enough. So bottom line is we have mayors in those 38 states which equal 80% of the population of America. They're going after the same renewable portfolio alternative sustainable energy that we were before. They're not changing. So I can proudly tell you Donald Trump may have pulled out of the Paris Agreement, but the American people overwhelmingly are still in the agreement. And we're going to try and hold on to it. Now, here's a bigger problem, and we're not going to solve it tonight, but I'll just present you the, the challenge. Not one country in the world is living sustainably. Not one. So when the question is asked about resources and where we're heading, we have a huge challenge ahead of us. What makes me optimistic and, 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 and believing we can meet the challenge ultimately is if we have the leadership that puts the choices on the table, folks, I believe technology and science can help fill the gaps with respect. I don't think we're going to use every ounce of oil and gas. We're going to get, we're going to get off it. The question is, are we going to get off it fast enough? Last year in the United States of America, 75% of the new electricity that came online in our country was solar. Did you know that? 75%. You know how much coal was after all Donald Trump's been saying about coal? 0.2%. That's what makes, I think the marketplace can move in that direction and there'll be new, new fabrication materials. It won't necessarily be wood, it'll be something else. We don't have to cut down a tree. We can have sustainable forests. We can begin to build things with new materials. We will find ways to deal because I think we have that ingenuity. And we have to bet on that, folks. We really do have to bet on that because otherwise it, you know, it really does get to be bleak. But I think we can manage. We can have much better food production. If women were brought in to have access to the same seeds, the same technology, the same machinery that men have in farming around the world, we'd add, we'd reduce 100 to 150 million people who are hungry in the world today. There are things we can do that will advance uh, life. And look at us. We're living longer than human beings have ever lived. We're living healthier. We're living better even though people are working harder in America and we're not doing as well. Writ large, there's far less violence today claiming the lives of people anywhere in the world despite our abhorrence of someone having their head cut off in the desert in a jumpsuit or despite, uh, you know, bombs going off in one place or another. The fact is the last century, 30 million people in Russia alone in World War II, 6 million Jews, World War I, 
Korea, Vietnam. Think about it. Because we're not seeing the same kind of state-on-state -state violence, with the exception of Putin in Ukraine, by and large. We saw Rohingya and the Burmese, disgraceful, but one or two instances are so different from the last century. Our challenge right now is non-state actors. And that's where I think our engagement, John, is so critical, and I'll end on this, but it's relevant to what we're talking about. There are two billion young people between the ages of 15 and 24 in the world. That's a mischief age. I mean, it really is. Particularly for young men in North Africa, South Central Asia, and the Middle East. And a foreign minister friend of mine said to me, you know, what happens is the extremists grab these kids at age 12 or 13, and they proselytize to them, they pay them a stipend, and six months later they don't need to pay them anymore, they're sold, and they go out and recruit. And the phrase that just chilled me, that he left me with, this foreign minister, and he's still active publicly, he said to me, John, they have a, these guys have a 35-year plan, and we don't even have a five-year plan. See, that's what I think we bring to the table. The United States of America has the ability to bring five-year plans to the UN and to the world. We galvanized action on refugees. We weren't able to solve Syria, but guess what? We gave more money and did more for refugees than any other nation on the planet. We brought other countries together at the UN to do it. So I believe if we have the right leadership, we can manage this question of materials and of the rate at which we are using up uh, the resources of the planet, and I'm convinced of our ability to make life sustainable if we will begin to make the right kinds of choices. And people are doing it individually in communities all around the world. So I, I think it's, a, it's really doable. So, thank you. So I am, I am very mindful of time, and I see long lines, and I'm, I'm sorry we're not gonna be able to get to everybody this evening. I really apologize. But if we can... Can us out of here? Because I'll, I'll stay a little longer, I don't mind. Uh, we can stay. Um, Unless you all are falling asleep or you got, you know. Well, let's take, let's take four questions over on this side. You, you don't have yeah. the Patriots to go home to. So. <laughs> so if you could keep your question very quick and, and sure. concise, thank you. So, hi, my name is Leah Keefe. Thank you both for coming out tonight. And, okay. Um, hi, my name is Leah Keefe. I'm really thankful um, for both of you coming out tonight. Um, I was curious about how to get people who are my age and who are of voting age to get out and vote, how do, you, how do you get them to do that? Because the numbers are quite startling, and I'm worried about the Supreme Court, too. Hi, I'm uh, Bill Quillian. I'm a uh, professor of English uh, emeritus. Uh, I heard you speak very briefly with Chris Matthews about national service. National service is something I've been uh, interested in for a long time. Uh, I think we ought to have some options for kids graduating from high school who are not quite ready for the wonderful offerings that Mount Holyoke has and other you. So I'd just like to hear you say a word or two about national service. Thank you so much for your service, by the way. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, I was wondering, so during, uh, as, while you were Secretary of State, you worked uh, really hard to create peaceful negotiations between Israel and Palestine. Uh, you talked about how difficult that was. Ben Rhodes discussed in his book and in public about how difficult that was, and so did Obama. And that was during a time when the U.S. had relative leverage in the region. And with uh, Trump's new policy specifically moving um, uh, their, uh, the American embassy to Jerusalem and then cutting aid to Palestinians, I wonder what Democrats, specifically uh, contenders for 2020, should be thinking about when it comes to Israel and Palestine um, and just the future of a peace uh, deal in your mind. Um, thank you, my name is Madeline Fitzgerald and I'm a sophomore here. So I know you spoke to Ronan Farrow for his book, The War on Peace, and he spoke about the decline of um, American diplomacy. And he spoke about how during the Obama administration there was like a proliferation of celebrity generals and the State Department has essentially declined in like glamour and prestige and sort of like general like focus and importance. And given that you were the Secretary of State during the Obama administration, I'm wondering if you could share sort of your thoughts about the future of the State Department and sort of, yeah, the future of the State, State Department and the future of diplomacy in this country. Thank you. So I wonder if we can um, maybe 
answer these questions, and then uh, Secretary Kerry has generously agreed to sign some books at the end of the, the event this evening. Um, and maybe for those of you who have still have questions, we can do some questions and let the rest of the audience uh, depart this evening. But we would line up after um, afterwards with those of you who have blue tickets can line up first. We'll start over here, uh, and Secretary Kerry will uh, sign books. Um, uh, and those of you who have yellow tickets will line up kind of on the back side uh, after those with the blue tickets, apparently. So, so let me try. I'll, I'll be very quick here. Um, the young woman who asked uh, about getting the boat out, I, I think I've said some things about it. But look, um, that's where leadership is important. I mean, I, I really believe leaders have to motivate people sufficiently that you believe there's a reason to go out and vote. Um, and if they're not credible, or they're not providing an answer to a, a legitimate impulse or need that you have, it's not going to happen. Um, my hope is that enough young folks are now getting engaged that they're going to drag their roommates and their friends and their classmates and others along with them. Uh, and, and that's our best hope. We need young people to vote. We desperately need young people to vote. And I would think, particularly on college campuses, there, there, there ought to be a real understanding of the, uh, of the stakes. I mean, I can understand in some places people may not have as much of a feeling of a stake in the community around them. But boy, if you're on a campus like this or anywhere else in America getting a great education, there's, there's zero excuse for not being out <laughs> campaigning. Um, with respect to uh, national service, I'm, I'm delighted to say something about it. I have always believed that, that everybody in our nation ought to give something back, uh, and I believe there ought to be a form of national service. I am not somebody who believes everybody has to go into the military, obviously. Um, and you don't have to be a conscientious objector not to go in. You, you, you should just have a choice. But there's something for everybody to do. There's no question in my mind. And we should be organizing ourselves in a way that makes that possible. So many other countries have mandatory service. I mean, in Israel, everybody serves. In other countries, everybody serves. And I think that, that taking a year out of your life, I mean, I, I write about this in the book. I was a perfect, uh, I was a perfect candidate for a gap year because, uh, you know, I was not extraordinarily motivated, even though I was privileged to be at a great university. I did a lot of extracurricular activities. I played sports and debated and, uh, you know, was engaged in politics and everything else. But um, I think that uh, it really wasn't until law school that I began to learn how to think. So I think it's good for people to go out. I also think you learn leadership skills. I learned real leadership skills in the military. When you have men, back then was men, now women too, uh, who are in your command and there are life and death decisions and you're uh, responsible for young folks younger than you, you learn a lot. And um, it was a graduate school of its own kind and I learned hierarchy and management and leadership and responsibility and all these kinds of things. So I urge young people everywhere I go to think about go into the military, go in. The other thing that bothers me or into any other service, and here's the other things I think we could do. We could have kids going in and helping in schools we could have young people going in. We could put a year into education. We could put a year into um, working as a uh, nurse's aide or hospital assistant or assisted living. Or I mean, there are just so many things. You could, you could work on the environment in your community. You could work on recycling. You could help your community implement a full measured program. You could do, there's so much to be done. There is no rationale for not being able to harness the energy of young people who then get a sense of contribution to community and of how you legitimately build the strength of, of our great country. In fact, de Tocqueville in the 1800s when he visited America and wrote his wonderful you know, observations said that, the, that, that Americans were unique because we uh, alone among most anybody he'd seen do charity. We give to other people. We take care of people in our own community. There's a sense of of, of responsibility. And that's a, that's a big deal that I think national service could, 
could help. The final reason I think it's important is the voluntary service, the volunteer army has worked, but it's not a cross-section of America. And I personally feel after Vietnam particularly, one of the reasons Vietnam went on as long as it did was because the sons and daughters of a lot of powerful people in America didn't have to serve. And that's wrong. Um, I think everybody bears that responsibility. Uh, and so I am for some form of service. Now you've got to work out the cost issues, and et cetera, but I think it's doable. Um, you know, if we're going to pay people, you know, if we've got these student loans, there are all kinds of ways to work on student loans as part of the reduction for the service. So there are all kinds of things we could do that would make the country stronger and also reduce the burden of debt that people have. Um, on Palestine, Israel, look, I, I, I am a huge... Israel supporter, have been all my life, 28 years in the Senate. I had a 100% voting record, and I believe in the dream of Israel as a democracy in the region, land of milk and honey, and, and uh, I want it to succeed. My fear is that the current course Israel is on, regrettably, uh, is not providing the basis by which the, the, the Palestinians are able to build capacity and, and be able to find uh, a peace. Now, I, I want to be fair here. Uh, President Abbas and the Palestinian Authority missed its own opportunities several times to try to make peace. And Israeli leaders, Barak, Ehud Barak, Rabin, uh, uh, Shimon Peres, others, all tried to move the process down the road. The current government in Israel has a majority of cabinet members who have publicly stated there will never be a Palestinian state. So right now, things are kind of deadlocked and frozen. And one of the great lessons of diplomacy is you need ripeness as part of a negotiation. It's not just a decision you make about whether you want to do something. You may want to do it, but you have neither party prepared to take the steps necessary to do it. And I think in the end, there's a great question looming for Israel, which is if the majority population between the Jordan River Valley and the Mediterranean is non-Jewish, as it is today, how can you be one state and be Jewish and a democracy at the same time? No one has been able to answer that question, and I think that question is the principal challenge of where, how you go forward. But Israel is going to have to make its own decision. We're not going to decide it for them, nor should we. We can't decide it for them. We can't decide it for a government that says there won't be a Palestinian state. Uh, and so something has to begin to emerge in the democracy that is there in, uh, in Israel itself. And that's something we all have to hope for and pray for. The final question was um, uh, Madeline wanted to know about The, ah, yes, the future of the State Department, Madeline. Um, I am confident, uh, no matter what, we're going to have a State Department that's going to be a very important entity for our nation. And happily, we have extraordinary young men and women who still want to take and do take the Foreign Service exam who want to give their lives to being diplomats and being involved in the Foreign Service, and we're very lucky to have those young people. Um, there are, unfortunately, many people who resigned over the course of the last year and a half, two years, uh, a combination of factors, but they chose to do that. I won't go into all of the factors, but I think that it depends a lot on what happens in the next two years. Um, if America has a course correction in this election and then we elect a president in 2020, I think it will take a matter of months to turn around the relationship with most countries in the world where they are ruptured and difficult, like some of our best friends, Canada, NATO, Europe. Uh, it'll take longer to replenish the State Department and there'll be a gap in experience in the professional cadre of people coming up that you rely on 
sort of next generation of leaders. But we'll get there. We will get there. And I suspect that if the next president does the right things, we can bring back a great number of the people who saw fit to leave uh, and replenish it fairly rapidly. So I'm a believer in the State Department, the 700,000 people total around the world. That's including, that's not all Americans, that's including people we hire in other countries who are indigenous citizens to help us in that country. They're, they're critical to the work of the State Department. Um, and, and the work we do every day around the world is critical to making our country safer in one way or another. Uh, I'm a huge fan and advocate, and I admire the sacrifices that, uh, that people in the State Department make. I write in my book about a young woman, Ann Smetinghoff, who escorted, she was what my, we call my control officer. She was one of the chief people who, who was responsible for building my trip when I went to Afghanistan. And she was brilliant and, and effervescent, uh, uh, motivated, creative, capable. And she introduced me to 10 women in Afghanistan who had started businesses. And they were multi-million dollar businesses now. Unheard of in a country that had no women doing almost anything. When we went into Afghanistan in 2001, there were about a million kids in school and they were all boys. Now there are seven million, eight million kids in school and about 45% of them are girls. It's an incredible story of empowerment of women in a country. And obviously we have to, we've got to sort through how we're gonna disengage from Afghanistan. It's very expensive, there are a lot of reasons. But bottom line is, that's the work of the State Department. I'm sad to say that three weeks after I left, Ann Smetinghoff was killed by a suicide bomber. And she was delivering books to a school. Those are the kind of people we have in the State Department, folks. And um, we should all be very proud that we get that kind of citizen to go to work for us. I want to thank, I want to thank all of you um, for coming out tonight on a, on a rainy night. And I want to thank Secretary Kerry again for um, uh, this conversation this evening. Mm -hmm.